drop him at. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to From the Ground Up podcast. Thank you all for joining us. So today we're going to talk to Russ of Aquarimax, but first, PoorCityPythons.com. Uh, Poor City Pythons on Instagram, Facebook, all that good stuff. Please follow us on social media and please share this podcast. That would be great. Um, if you could just tell a herper friend or invert friend or exotic species loving friend about this podcast. And I have like a weird request that's kind of narcissistic. But <laughs> if you listen on um, iTunes podcast, we would love it if you would like rate with the little five stars or leave a nice review (laughs) or a very brutally honest review uh okay one of those but leave a review um i don't know it's just something i feel weird asking about that you guys exist in front of a wall (laughs) (laughs) i hate that you breathe breathe the same air but um other than that we have taken our animals out of brumation and so all the fun stuff will be happening soon. Um, but we have isopods available on our website and on eBay. Except if you want clowns, pause. Because <laughs> we're trying to keep up with the clown game. The clown game. And what else? What else? Is that it? We I also guess? have substrates available oh, and yeah. good stuff like that. So check out poorcitypythons.com. Other than that, um, is there anything... Uh, we have the Syracuse show coming up April, I believe it's 26. Mm-hmm. But so, Herp show again, that will be if there. You guys are in upstate New York, central New York, western New York, anywhere in New York, check that out. SYR Reptile Expo. But before that, the Herp show. And before that, we're going to be at the Herp show in New Orleans. Yes. And I posted, bleh, I posted this on our Facebook. But no one answered. So if anyone is in New Orleans who's like a reptile keeper who has like something awesome, you think Joe and or I, probably just Joe, should come check out or see. <laughs> um, hit him up. Probably just me. Well, I just got pre-wedding stuff to do. So. Yeah, so she's going to be in a wedding and I'm going to be attending a wedding. So she has a lot more stuff to do. So I'm going to be bored. Yes. Yeah, so keep them busy, people. Yeah. And, you know, we got to make it a business expense. So we got to make a video out of it or something. Yes. Okay, great. You want to introduce a guest? I am. So today, he has been, uh, a bunch of people asked to have him on. As soon as we talked about isopods, he was the first person that come up. So today's guest, you've seen him on YouTube. He is Russ of Aquarimax Pets. Russ, thank you so much for being here. And uh, how are you doing? I'm doing great. And I'm really excited to be here with you, Joe and Melissa. Awesome. I appreciate you coming on with us. And can you give us a little insight on how you got started? I mean, whether it's aquariums or reptiles or inverts, I mean, how did you kind of get started? Okay. Well, I got to, I got to start with this. My mom tells this story, true story. When I was 18 months old, she was cleaning my pockets out to do laundry and found they were full of earthworms. (gasps) I, I just shoved them full of earthworms. And right at the moment, she let out a scream and she realized, oh, he's going to be one of those kids. And she just let it all out right then. And it, it turned out to be true. I was into animals from, from that point on. Uh, I was, you know, when I was four years old, I was trying to catch tree frogs, found my first garter snake around the same age. By the time I was eight, I was raising tadpoles to froglets. Um, fast forward a few years and, you know, this was the 80s where information was not easy to obtain. So I was reading every book I could at library about reptiles and amphibians and insects and whatever else. And keeping reptiles, I had horned lizards and curly-tailed iguanas and anoles and uh, toads and all kinds of things, doing my best to take care of them. Some of them did really well, some of them didn't do so well. Fast forward a few years um, into the late 90s, early 2000s, and I was married and I had uh, some reptiles at that point. I had leopard geckos and things like that, but then we moved to Hawaii and I couldn't keep, I couldn't bring anything with me. No pets. I had to rehome everything and that was awful. But when we got there, they said, you can only keep fish and birds here in the, in the housing. And a lot of reptiles were illegal there anyway. And so I I couldn't keep any reptiles there. I had morning geckos that would come into the house and house geckos that would come into the house. And we saw, you know, all kinds of herps outside. Um, largely geckos and things like that, but they had the huge cane toads 
and different things that live there, the day geckos that live there. So that was cool. But once we got back here, I really missed morning geckos. And so I got a trio of morning geckos and they started breeding. And I started getting into bioactive uh, vivaria because of that. And of course, because of that, I got into isopods. And so now I have a big collection of inverts, quite a few reptiles, some amphibians, some birds, one mammal. And, uh, but among those, isopods figure prominently. So. Awesome. And I mean, Hawaii, I, there's no native snakes there, right? There, there are no native snakes. That's correct. There's one species of snake that lives there, and that's the flower pot snake. You've probably heard of them. These little parthenogenetic uh, snakes that get about, you know, five or six inches long. And that's it. That's all I've got. I'm so shocked then that it's so restrictive in well, what you can keep. A lot of things could live there. I guess you yeah, don't want anything to take over. Right. And the native bird population would be especially vulnerable to snakes. Mm -hmm. So they have like two snakes in the zoo and they can't even have two of the same species in case. <laughs> in the happen. zoo? They don't even yeah. trust their zoo people? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's crazy. When I was there, I used to volunteer at the zoo there and they had... Uh, I think one reticulated python and one more snake. I don't remember what it was. That was it. Wow. Well, I mean, there's there's pros and cons. I mean, you're in Hawaii. So <laughs> right. You got to do what you got to do. So right. so what really got you interested in isopods? Because I feel like they weren't even on people's radar until just a couple of years ago, really. Right. And I started getting into isopods, I think it was about seven years ago, uh, because isopods in general have been a bigger thing in the dart frog hobby mm -hmm. than they have been anywhere else um, for a long time. But as far as the diversity of species that we have now, not even close, but they were using dwarf whites as bioactive cleanup crew members. And uh, they were using the Spanish orange. We now just call them usually Porcelio scaber orange, but they called them the giant orange at the time because they were much bigger than the dwarf whites. And so people were keeping those two species mainly uh, in the dart frog community a long time ago. And uh, so that's how I got into it because I was looking into uh, bioactive vivariums for my morning geckos before I, before I got any, I wanted to set up a bioactive vivarium for them. And doing the research, I discovered this thing about the isopods. And so I found a local dart frogger who had, you know, maybe three or four species of isopods and got some from him around seven years ago and including Spanish orange uh, and dwarf whites. Wow. So what was your initial, I mean, setup for those animals and kind of how has that changed over time? <laughs> well, I got to think back. I remember uh, using, I did use leaf litter and cork bark for them. I remember that. But I was also, uh, I used just cocoa fiber as the, like the base substrate. And then we put leaf litter and cork bark. Uh, on top of it, I could go up into the, the mountains here and collect oak and maple leaf litter. So that's mainly what I used. And they were breeding like crazy. Um, I didn't feed them near the variety of food that I feed now, but they still did pretty well. I mean, you can, you can do well with isopods on some pretty basic food. So uh, I would say I have ramped up my, my substrate, definitely, in terms of the quality of the substrate I provide. I like to use a mixture of, you know, I get the, the barbecue or the smokers pellets and soak them like the oak pellets, soak them in water and add that. Um, I don't use a lot of cocoa fiber. I use organic compost as a base. And then I really mix up the leaf litter with a lot of different leaf types. And I think that's beneficial. And I'm definitely much better about providing a moisture gradient to them than I used to be. When I first started out, I was like, okay, I'm just going to be uniformly slightly moist and that's all I'm going to do. But now, you know, with things like the Spanish isopods that don't do well with that, um, I, they, they need uh, moisture, you know, a moist hide, but they need a lot of dry area too. And so I think I've changed a lot in that direction, especially as I branched out into other species. And why have you strayed away from coconut? Well, it's not that coconut fiber is bad necessarily, but there's a couple of things. One is if it gets too wet, it tends to go acidic and that can cause mass die offs. Um, so, and it's just not as nutritious. Uh, you know, if you're going to put, I've noticed this is sort of a, a ballpark figure because it's, it's an estimate. I haven't done like, you know, peer reviewed journal article submissions on this particular topic, but I would say that uh, I've approximately increased the isopod product productivity by about uh, three times 
what it was on cocoa mm. fiber just by changing the, the substrate to a better substrate. Wow. So, and I guess we can go back a little bit, but uh, what are you keeping them in? Okay. Well, my basic substrate is, and this, I got this from uh, someone on arachnoboards.com named Mickey M who is a, you know, she, she watches my channel and so on and we've exchanged critters and things like that. But I always like to give her credit because she is the one who introduced me to the recipe. Um, and you break up the recipe into roughly thirds. One third is organic leaf compost, if you can get it. If you can't get organic leaf compost, then you try for an organic compost that is that doesn't contain manure. And if you can't do that, then get something with composted manure. And uh, that's one third. Uh, the next third is the, the smoker's pellets. Oak is the best if you can get it. I've used alder. Alder works fine too, works pretty well. And basically, they look like rabbit food pellets or something like that. And you soak them in water and they expand and become like wet sawdust. So you mix that in and that decomposes and provides the wood that the isopods need. And then um, one third is crushed up leaf litter, hardwood leaf litter. And I can get organic leaf litter here because we have a half an acre and we don't have, we don't spray our trees or anything or our grass. And so I collect that and I just put bags and bags of it in our shed and then over the winter just use it up. Um, I could probably go through a bag in a month, uh, you know, a huge mm -hmm. leaf bag in, in one month uh, with all the isopods I have. And then, you know, things like uh, powdered eggshell for calcium, I add that. And then they need some bark. I like to use cork bark for hides, but I can add maple or oak bark too because they'll eat that as well. And they don't really eat the cork bark or if they do it so slow that it would take years. So um, that's kind of how I do it. And then um, a handful of moist sphagnum moss in one side, keep that moist to keep the rest of it drier. And depending on the species, anything from bone dry to just slightly drier than the, than the sphagnum moss. And then ventilation, of course, super important. Some species need very little, like uh, Porcellia lavis dairy cow doesn't need a lot. Um, dwarf whites don't need a lot for a couple of species that don't. And then with the Spanish Porcellio, they need a lot of ventilation. Um, and the, most of the armadillidium need a decent amount of ventilation too. So what are you keeping them in as far as like, what are they contained in? And mm -hmm. then also how are you adjusting that to be properly ventilated? Okay. Well, uh, for small cultures, I usually use a six quart um, Sterilite tub. Uh, most of my smaller cultures are in there and depending on the size of the culture, when it's a really small culture, I might put it in a deli cup. But uh, when it's a, a, a small to moderately sized culture, I like to use the uh, six quart Sterilite tubs. And if there's minimal ventilation required, I don't even need to add any because you know it's not airtight and, and right. that's fine. So for my dwarf whites, they're not ventilated any more than just the fact that the lid's not airtight. Uh, if it is something that needs more ventilation, I'll use a hole saw or sometimes just uh, uh, like a utility knife or whatever, cut a couple of one inch holes in it, cover them with uh, chiffon because that's fine enough to keep the fungus Yay. gnats out because uh, fungus gnats are the bane of an ice pod keeper's existence and they will eventually find you. So <laughs> I, uh, I like to use chiffon because normal screen will let those in and out whenever they mm. want. Whereas uh, the, the chiffon will help prevent them from coming in. Of course, if you're not using a container with gasket seal around it, they can still get through there, but there, there's going to be less of it. If you really want to keep them out, you've got to use a gasket seal and then chiffon for the ventilation. I don't know what fungus gnat is, and I don't want to even picture it in my brain, but do we have <laughs> those in our house? Well, we have snakes, so I mean, we always have forage flies. I mean, is that pretty much, is a fungus gnat something different? Fungus gnat is something different. Um, they're similar to forage flies in a lot of ways, but uh, forage flies are basically looking for, you know, uh, dead animal remains and they might go after feces or whatnot as well uh, and that's why they're attracted to snake enclosures because it ate a rodent and you know so it's going to go after the feces most likely um, fungus gnats are smaller uh, than a forage fly and a lot thinner and they are going for fungus that actually grows in the substrate uh, the same kind of thing that springtails eat so one of the best ways to keep um, fungus gnats from being a real problem in your cultures is make sure you have a robust population of springtails um, and Isopods and springtails together, once they're thriving in a culture, they're going to basically outcompete the fungus gnats. They're not going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. But in that initial stage, when you have a dozen isopods or two dozen isopods in a six quart sterilite tub, there's a vacuum that needs to be filled, and those fungus gnats are going to come 
find that fungus and start eating it unless you have a ton of springtails in there. So are you putting springtails in every one of your isopod cultures? I do. I do. I have springtails in every one of my isopodian cultures and they, they really do a good job at helping to keep those fungus nets down. The thing is, with as many cultures as I have, I'm, I've always got new cultures of some kind going on, uh, isopod cultures. And so there are always going to be some fungus nets. And so, you know, they're there. Uh, and I also have millipedes and other things that have, you know, that attract fungus nets. Any kind of substrate like that will attract fungus nets. Uh, and so I use uh, the, um, what do you call them? The fly tapes, those fly ribbons that you just hang from. And I put mm -hmm. them in my closet oh, so I don't have to I stare at them. I love those. Yeah, love and they're non-toxic so and they're really helpful and you don't have to do anything special with them uh, to attract the fungus nets. They're naturally attracted to them just like house flies are. And so boom, they, they'll, they'll get them. And as long as I keep those you know, fresh, that really helps keep the fungus nets down too. And as far as the, the leaf litter goes, James in the chat um, asked, do you do any type of sanit sanitization for the leaves? I do. I do. I put them in the oven at about 200 degrees for about half an hour. And that kills off just about everything. And I have had, the only issues I've had really is when I've been training my kids so they can earn a little pocket money. They <laughs> help with a lot of the jobs. And that's one of the jobs they help with is sanitizing the leaves. And I think initially we had a little bit of a trouble when I was training my, my son how to cook them. He wasn't quite doing it enough. And so we ended up with these leaf litter moths that eat leaf litter that would come in um, and show up in the isopod colonies once in a while. But um, other than that, it's been fine and has killed off everything. Most kids' chores growing up are like taking out the trash, washing the dishes. <laughs> but oh, when your dad does isopods, your chore is to cook leaves. <laughs> yep, yep. And they're they're feeding the isopods. They're they're wiping down the glass, you know, spring and wiping down the glass in the vivariums. And they're feeding the geckos. And they're doing all these kinds of things. So See, it's pretty we don't cool. need an employee. We need to reproduce we need children. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they like it because they get money and uh, they get something to put on their resume. Honestly, they're caring for all these exotic creatures. And uh, it's pretty cool. It, it makes my life easier, too, because there's a lot to do. And if, if they weren't here to help me, I couldn't maintain what I can maintain. Kind of side note, but are they naturally inclined to be into inverts or reptiles, amphibians? Fortunately, yes. All of them have at least one pet of their own and uh, are interested in all different kinds of animals. I think they've grown up with it ever since, you know, there's never been a time. Well, besides the first week we were in Hawaii, because we could not bring anything, uh, we've had a pet their entire lives, at least one, and generally many more than that. <laughs> awesome. And, and fortunately, my wife uh, is the daughter of two zookeepers. Oh, wow. And so um, that, you know, that's always been a natural part of her life, animals as well. So it made it easy. So were you guys animal people separate, meaning before you met each other, were you both animal people? Well, by the time um, I met my wife, my, uh, my in-laws had, had retired from the zookeeping business. And so when she was a baby, there were you know, bear cubs in their house and stuff like that. But she didn't really <laughs> remember any of that. Uh, but they did have cats and dogs and goldfish and things like that. So in a sense, she had been surrounded by animals of some kind. She was not so connected to the exotic kind of things that uh, I was into at the time, but she has since, you know, grown into it and has uh, enjoyed keeping them as well. There are some she's not as excited about as I am, but she has her own crested gecko, for example. The first crested gecko we ever got, I brought her to a reptile expo one year, and she was like, oh, this is pretty cool. That gecko looks really funky. And then the next year, she's like, I need one of those. I need this crested gecko. It is calling my name. She brought it home and we raised up this little hatchling and she's our buddy and she's right over here in this vivarium. Oh, that's awesome. So we'll snap back into isopod care. Sorry, <laughs> sorry folks, we get sidetracked. Uh, so you said you offer them a bunch of different foods. So what do mm -hmm. isopods eat? Well, isopods will eat nearly anything they can get. And of course, the uh, leaf litter should be a main component of their diet. Um, that's a, a large part of what they eat in the wild, in the wood. You know, the, the decomposing wood. And that's why they're called wood lice in the UK, for example, because they really do eat uh, decaying wood a lot. 
So those two items should be present in their enclosure at all times. But supplemental foods are important for increasing their, their productivity and for general health and, and so on. So I like to offer them a variety of foods. For protein, one thing my go-to is uh, fish food pellets. I like to use goldfish pellets because they're a high, they're a good source of protein. They have chitin in them generally because they have shrimp meal and things like that in them. And isopods, you know, their exoskeletons are made of chitin. And so that's a, a good nutrient for them to have. And they also contain various other nutrients that are, are beneficial. So uh, I give a lot of fish food pellets. I also provide um, things like rapashi bug burger and rapashi morning wood, uh, foods like that. People who feed crested geckos and so on are familiar with the company at least. They may not use those particular um, diets, but those are uh, a big part of my isopods diet. And then there are tons of companies these days that produce other isopod foods. Supreme Gecko produces an isopod chow that I use. Um, is it Vivariums in the Mist produces various other types of isopod foods, including dried mealworms. You can also buy those in bulk for chickens, and those are good food for isopods. Um, various things like that. And then as far as fresh fruits and vegetables, I like to use things like green beans. Um, mm. Canned green beans work fine, whether they're salted or not, doesn't matter. They, they love those. Um, sliced organic sweet potatoes, I can get those at Costco. Slice those up and throw them mm. in, and they just munch those things. If you ever get a mango, and you don't know what to do with the pit, put the pit into an isopod culture and they'll swarm all over it and clean the thing off. So um, any, just about any kind of fruit or vegetable they'll eat. And sometimes weird things like uh, I have to, when I, when I was uh, just started out with my garter snakes, when they were really, really tiny, and I would cut up the reptilinks that I had mm -hmm. to give them. I had the, the bigger reptilinks for my corn snake and was giving them the little tiny bits. And sometimes... They're, they were such tiny snakes, they wouldn't finish it off. And so I throw that in there with uh, especially dairy cows, and it's just gone. They'll eat it like lightning because they, they're protein-craving species, as are some others, and they would just clean that up. Are, oh, are there some fruits and vegetables that, like, provide or are better for them? Or is it just kind of like all's a fair game, all's equal, or...? I think just about anything. There, there's nothing that I really avoid except I do tend to go organic with it or at least peel it really well. And even, even if it is organic, I still peel it because, you know, some of the organic pesticides target invertebrates. And uh, so, yeah, I will peel it and make sure it's clean for them. But other than that, just about anything goes. And is there such thing, because I know at least in my cultures, it seems like sometimes I'll kind of over, if I overfeed, I'll get some negative effects and side effects of that. So, I mean, how do you know exactly how much food to put in there? That is a great question. And uh, a young culture is especially susceptible to that, uh, to mold and things like that, if, if the food uh, doesn't get finished right away. And I would say that most people overfeed their younger cultures. And it's just important to go back in within 24 hours, see what's in there. And if they haven't finished it, if they're still actively eating it, go ahead and leave it in there. And if they're not, just take it out. Uh, and it depends on what it is. I mean, some things are much more susceptible to mold. Things like really moist uh, vegetables or fruits like uh, mango or banana are, are going to mold pretty fast. Fish food, if it's a moist uh, enclosure, are going to mold pretty fast. But things like sweet potato, you can usually leave that in there for weeks and it'll just slowly eat it and it won't mold under most conditions. So um, that I think that's important. Just keep your eye on it. Uh, you kind of want to get to the point where they're almost finishing off what you gave them and then, but not quite finished with it. And then you feed them again. So is the, is the cork bark, and I know I've seen so many people with cultures with cork bark in them, but like you said, it doesn't seem like they eat it. So, I mean, is that just some type of like natural hide for them because i've seen people lift up a cork bark and there's like hundreds of isopods under it um right. do they just benefit from that from some other some other way i i think there's a couple of different things going on one of them i think that cork bark because it is naturally basically a it has natural mold retardants in it because the way the cells are put together and they've got waxes that protect it and I think that's part of the reason that uh, isopods don't eat it because it's not very susceptible to rot. So it's, it's not very nutritious for them and probably not very palatable for them either. Um, that makes it a long lasting hide from our standpoint. But I do think on the surface of it, I think things grow on the surface of it and the isopods kind of graze it off. 
that my observations seem to bear that out that there's something that will just grow on the surface and it's not really the wood that they're eating per se but they're eating something that's growing on it maybe um, a thin layer of fungus that's feeding on whatever they're tracking onto the wood or whatever and then there's some thigmotaxis going on basically they're just they love surfaces and they need to feel like they're up against the surface and cork bark provides a lot of that hmm. And how many isopods, whether it's species, color phases, all that stuff, I mean, how many are available in the hobby? Oh, that is a great question. And it's, it's changing all the time. So it's, it's hard to even say. Um, I would say I've got about 30 different types, something like that. And I'm not anywhere near what some people have. I mean, there are people, I would not hesitate to say that in the hobby right now, there are well over 60 different uh, probably species, and then there are color morphs on top of that for some of the species. And that could well be a, a low estimate. They're, they're constantly like, uh, right now there's a big Cubaris craze, from Southeast Asian isopods being uh, imported, and they're just discovering new species all the time. And what is the best isopod for a beginner? Well, I don't know if I could give you one species, but I can narrow it down and give you a couple of ideas. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, you can't go wrong. And uh, actually, Supreme Gecko just did a video on this because he does a lot of isopod stuff too. Uh, you can't go wrong with just going and getting some roly polies, Armadillidium vulgari, out of your backyard and trying that out first because one, it's free. And uh, two, you're going to be able to take care of them and provide what they need really easily. Um, so that is, is a pretty good uh, place to start. But, you know, they're not the most colorful. They're not the largest. But they're a good thing to start with if you just want to see how does this whole isopod thing works. And they're charming in their own way. I mean, I know Melissa has mentioned that isopods are her favorite thing just because they're, they're bug-like in, in past <laughs> podcasts and whatnot. And I get that. I get that. But uh, and, and I appreciate your patience in listening to all this isopod <laughs> talk. <laughs> but... Uh, I think they, they do have a sort of appeal that people just, they kind of fall in love with them. And it doesn't really matter what kind they are, what color or whatever. But I would say that for me, one of my very, very favorite species is the uh, Porcelia Levis dairy cow, the dairy cow morph. And they are an excellent beginner ice pod, one, because they're practically bulletproof. Two, because they get large compared to, you know, the Armadillidium vulgari or any ice pod you're normally going to find in your backyard they get pretty big an impressive size they're very very day active and for someone who wants to see activity all the time that's that's perfect and then they've got these really nice clean patterns on them they're um before you know people kept porcelio scaber dalmatian morph and the people still do i have that that morph i got a couple different varieties of the morph in fact but their patterns are kind of dirty and not very dependable like one generation might I think there might be some codominance or something going on. You get one generation where they look really nice, and then the next generation they're kind of diluted. Like the super form of the gene is is less patterned or something. Yeah, my my orange Dalmatians went from orange Dalmatians to white, and now I just have white ones. I'm like, damn, I want them to look. I want them to be with orange little spots on them. Exactly, and I think that is what's going on. Something like that is happening, but with the the dairy cows, it's not like that at all. With the dairy cows they consistently have a really clean pattern and a really uh, like well-distributed pattern. You're not going to get very many uh, dairy cows that, that have uh, a weak pattern. It, it, I, I think I've seen one patternless white in all of you know, the hundreds and hundreds I've raised and the rest of them all have really nice patterns. So that's a great one. Has anyone ever tried to figure out, I mean, how these are being passed on, how the genes work exactly, incomplete, recessive, so forth? With, yeah, with some. Uh, back in the, the early days before the real ice pod craze began, um, I was, uh, along with some of the earlier people who were playing with this, um, there's a guy named Ryan Orr and a guy named Alan Gross who uh, were playing around with ice pod genetics pretty early on. And Ryan was the one who figured out that if he could cross, uh, he isolated some orange isopods from his own scaber that he collected in his backyard. So this was not one that was in the hobby. He found an orange one, it had babies and he got a big population going. And he said, if this is the same species as uh, Dalmatian, I should be able to cross these. And if it's single gene recessive, I should be able to get 
you know, F ones that are just wild types cross those again. And I should be able to get some orange Dalmatians. So we did it. He created them. And then right at the same time that he was doing that, I said, I'm going to try doing it. I was copying him. I'll be clear. I'm not saying that I came up with it independently. I didn't, but I just, he started talking about, this is my experiment. I'm doing it. And I jumped on it and said, I'm going to do it too. And I did. And so I was behind him, but at the same time I produced orange Dalmatians because that's how those particular genes work. Um, they are just uh, single gene recessive traits. There are other uh, varieties of isopods that are sex linked, for example, some of the calico strains are, sex linked the calico i have two calico strains and one is sex linked and i suspect the other one is but i'm not entirely sure yet because it's a wild one that i found and i'm still working with that but uh and then there are other calico um ones that that are not sex linked so you never know um there's still there's a, still a lot they're figuring out there are a lot of recessive traits out there porcelio scaber is probably the species they've done the most um, genetic work with and there are a lot of different morphs of that species some were still trying to figure things out, like with Porcelio lavis. Some people are still suspecting that dairy cow is not the same species as the orange morph, and trying to get them to cross has been problematic. Hmm. So, so we're not sure. And these species, I mean, they whether they're native, they've been introduced. I mean, some of these are pretty widespread, right? Yeah, yeah. There are are quite a few species, and very few of the isopod species that we're familiar with in the U.S. are actually native here but most of them have been here for hundreds of years because they were just brought over uh, as uh, european colonization occurred um, that's when it happened i mean one of the main sources is suspected to be the uh, they used to use soil for ballast in ships and then they would come to shore and they would dump it and that they were they're suspecting a lot of the isopods were introduced that way Huh. So that may have happened hundreds of years ago. Hundreds even. of years ago, exactly. They, they suspect uh, what's most of the isopods, there are some native isopods in the U.S., but most of them are not because the glaciation events that occurred you know, in the last ice age basically scraped them off the continent. And the, most Literally. of the natives, right, right. And most of the native species were further south, and so that didn't happen. Wow. And I mean, are there any detrimental effects, I mean, to plants or any other wildlife because of these guys? Well, it is difficult to say. Um, the, um, the U.S. Plant Health and Inspection Station is, has ice pods on the radar and they are, I think it's Armadillidium vulgare has turned out to be a soybean pest at certain state life stages of soybeans. So since that's an agriculturally significant crop, you know, that's that could be a concern. I, I think in most cases, isopods tend to go for, um, you know, dead plant matter, but they will go for, they're opportunistic and they will go for live plant matter. I mean, I've had them eat my strawberries. That's about the only thing that I don't like about isopods outside my yard is that they'll eat my strawberries sometimes. So yeah, they will eat live uh, plant material if that's what they can get. Yeah, and uh, Gretel Guerra said in the chat, how does Russ feel about the over-harvesting of South Asian Cubera species to meet the consumer demand in the hobby? Some of these populations may not even have been identified in the wild and might be vulnerable. Yeah, I, I do think that is a concern. Um, I think the Cubera species are fantastic. There are some really beautiful ones in there, but we need to focus on captive breeding and not focus so much on um, the harvesting. I think there are enough of many of those uh, species in the hobby now. Uh, people should just stop collecting them, just need to get, get breeding them. Uh, it doesn't seem to be all that difficult to get them to breed. And so that's where the focus needs to be, I think. Yeah, I guess it, it makes sense. I mean, these animals are not very difficult to breed why would you need to keep on getting wild caught i understand some reptiles i mean we've been trying to get to breed for 20 years and are still imported and it's like you know we want to make captive populations but we can't exactly but i mean you put in these isopods in a deli cup or a six quart tub and just leaving them alone i mean are there any isopods that need any type of other stimulations to breed though well it, it depends. Um, some of the species are definitely more challenging to keep and breed than others. Uh, the Like the Spanish Porcelio definitely need to have a dry area and they definitely need to um, have a gradient. You know, if, if they are, um, if they're too damp, they will just die. 
you get mass die off. And that's true of some other species. Um, I know you've been working with clowns recently and they can do the same thing. If they get too moist, they can just, you just hit mass die offs. That happened to me when I was figuring out their husbandry. And I think I'm dialed in now, but at first I, I would get a big population I'm going and then they get a little bit too wet and boom, population would crash. And so there, there are species that are harder to do. Um, I haven't bred uh, rubber duckies yet, which is kind of surprising to me because most isopods will breed pretty easily for me, but I have not bred those. And, uh, and I can breed, you know, the Porcelia, the Spanish Porcelia, the species that I have have all bred for me. I've got lots of Porcelio magnificus and lots of Hoffman's agai and tons of Ornatus, but Ornatus is super easy. But, uh, you know, there's, there's, there are species that are a little bit more challenging. And I would suggest that, you know, when you, if people are going to get into things like the large Spanish Porcelio, they need to think about that. Um, are they really able to take care of them? Because you might be paying for some of them, you know, six, seven, eight dollars an individual. And then for the Cubaras, you might be paying 30. So you want to start out with something maybe a little bit easier. And when you say dry, is that dry in respect to other isopods or is that like legitimately dry if that makes any sense oh that totally makes sense for my uh spanish porcelio i have a humid area where like i was saying before i put the sphagnum moss there and i keep that area moist i try to uh, you know wet it down pretty well but i haven't wet down the other parts of their enclosure in months it, it doesn't need it they they want it they want to be able to go to an area where it is bone dry and what do you do as far as uh, spraying and stuff like that? Is that a weekly thing, daily thing? Does it depend on the species? Depends on the species, depends on the time of year and, uh, you know, and the ventilation in the enclosure because the dwarf whites, if I were to wet them down twice a week, would probably be in a, in a swamp because they don't have a lot of ventilation, so they're not losing a lot of moisture. But uh, with uh, most of my isopods, I usually wet it down twice a week-ish. Um, to make sure their their uh, moist area is indeed moist. And uh, it does depend on the time of year because, uh, for example, in with central heating, you're going to get a lot drier air in the house. And then during the summer, we use a swamp cooler. And so the humidity goes up in the mm -hmm. summer significantly here. Um, so, you know, I have to take all of that into account. And when you're uh, keeping all these different species of isopods and stuff like that, I mean, is there any, um, if they, if one got, one species got into another culture or something like that, I mean, is that generally frowned upon? Is that bad? <laughs> it is. It is. And part of the reason is because of the mutual exclusion principle. Basically, you can't have two species occupying the same niche over a period of time without one of them losing out. And that tends to happen with isopods. I, uh, in the early days, I inadvertently experimented with that. And, uh, and then I have done some other experimentation uh, deliberately just to see uh, what I can discover. But when I first got my isopods, there were dwarf whites in with all the cultures that I got. And I learned after a while that that was really bad for so the Porcelio um, Scaber orange. They, they would eventually start you know, they weren't reproducing very well because the dwarf whites were, were taking over. And so I separated them and then they did fine. And, and I've done some other, uh, that, that just tends to be the case. It depends on how uh, varied your ecosystem is. So if you have a huge vivarium with different, you know, micro climates, different micro environments in there, you might have several species that do well just because there's resource partitioning going on. They're not in direct competition, but in a smaller enclosure, that's a lot less likely to happen. And so, for example, in the leopard gecko bioactive vivarium that we have, I decided to seed it with, I think, three different species and see, you know, what happened. So I put in the dwarf purples, I put in uh, powder blues, and I put in zebra pill bugs. And for a year and a half, they all coexisted peacefully. And I was like, oh, isopod utopia, it has been achieved. This is cool. But no, what happened is the, uh, the powder blues, which I should have known because powder blues are, are crazy prolific breeders. Uh, they eventually just made all the zebras disappear. And for a year and a half, though, the, the zebras were doing fine and reproducing and, and there were good numbers in there. And then suddenly just, they just, they were gone. Wow. But, but all those species do well in a more arid environment? 
or as long as they have a uh, humid area to retreat to, I think that the, the um, dwarf purples tend to re retreat down to the lower areas of the substrate where it tends to be very moist anyway, uh, because even in a, in a leopard gecko enclosure, if you have the bioactive type of substrate I have, the top layer is, is quite dry as it needs to be. And then as you go deeper, it gets, it gets more moist so that the, the uh, gecko can you know, regulate its own humidity and create a gradient with tunnels and so on. Uh, but yeah, as long as they can get to a, a moist hide, they do really well. And powder blues tend to be a very uh, resistant ice pod in terms of aridity. It can be quite dry as long as they have a moist hide. They, they can spend a long time out of that moist, moist hide and do fine. And armadillidium have some of that same resistance, maybe not quite to that same degree, but they, they actually can tolerate a decent amount of dryness too. And are these, I mean, can your leopard gecko feed on them? I think she probably picks some of them off. Uh, once in a while. I think the powder blues are kind of fast for, you know, a chubby leopard gecko. And so she doesn't tend to get as many. Uh, with a bigger isopod, especially a bigger, slower isopod, I think she'd eat more of them. But the, the powder blues are just so fast that I don't think she gets a lot of them. And I guess we should go over kind of what common uh, species of isopod you can put in with your common pets. So, I mean, like say, I mean, you have a corn snake set up bioactively. So um, what is that set up like? Oh, well, it's actually my, my garter snakes that are set up bioactively. I haven't set up the corn snake bioactively yet, but I will. Uh, um, but it's not there yet. Uh, so the, with the corn snake, I will probably put powder blues or, you know, another morph of the same species, oranges or the Oreo crumbles or, you know, something like that. Just because they are kind of my go-to in a relatively uh, well-ventilated enclosure because they don't tend to eat and, you know, attack anything. They, they breed really quickly. They, they are really good cleaners and they're, they're tolerant of a wide variety of, of uh, situations. So, and I think they are the go-to for a lot of people. If it's not too moist and too um, poorly ventilated, um, that's like the species I recommend for almost any setup and they can tolerate a lot of warmth, but they don't need it. So that's great too. Um, so if you have a, a species that needs a lot of warmth in a bioactive enclosure, you can go with them, but it doesn't need it. So you can put it in with something with a lot less. As far as moisture enclosures like crested geckos, um, you could probably get away with them because they need a decent amount of ventilation too. But with, uh, I, I'm actually using dairy cows in one of my crested gecko enclosures. It's kind of an experiment. It's going really well. And I think because that it, the crested gecko probably picks some of them off once in a while, but they breed so fast, it doesn't matter. And then uh, with my dart frogs, I tried putting powder blues in there. Totally didn't work. I don't think there's enough ventilation for them. Uh, so I, I didn't see that it disappeared after a short time. So I put isopoda species tarragona in there and they did fine. What is that? I've never even heard of that one. I may need an explanation. <laughs> it, it's a fairly um, inconspicuous species. It's not really a hobby species so much as a cleanup crew species, but it is a Spanish species. Nobody really knows what species it is, which is why they call it Isopoda species tarragona. But it comes from the tarragona region, region of Spain, stays quite small, not as small as like a dwarf white, but much smaller than even a, like a powder blue. And it, there's a, an orange morph and then kind of a gray morph, and they seem to be parthenogenic. And... They're really good for uh, moist habitats. So I, I got some of those from a frogger friend a few years ago and have, have found that they're really useful for that kind of setup. They're good for a variety of temperatures too. And are these always coupled with springtails as well? Yes. Yes. I, I can't think of any case where I would do a bioactive setup without springtails in it. I, I just, I have them in with my leopard gecko and, you know, you want a more, uh, dryness tolerant springtail, but there are those in the, the hobby. So that's what I use. I have a couple of different species that I culture and I just, the, the species is Sinella curvaceta that I like to use in drier setups. And that's, yeah, I, I always, so is that your typical arid springtail that you see on the market? It's, it's one of them. I think there, there's more than one ice pod that goes, I'm more than one springtail, sorry, that goes as, uh, under the name of an arid springtail. And I think, frankly, there are times when people sell them, they're not sure what species they are. And, and even, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not able to key them out, or I, at least I haven't tried to key them out. Uh, but I was able to narrow it down so that I'm 
reasonably sure that the species I use is Sinella curvaceta, and the other species I use for the more human setups is Fulsomia candida. But I could be wrong. Yeah, as someone who has the arid and temperate species, I hell if I know what the, they're <laughs> both little white jumpy things. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, you have a question? I was no. ask somebody from the chat. Yeah. Um, one from a, a little bit earlier. Um, James Lewis asked. Uh, I'm assuming he's talking about isopods. Um, do they include gut protozoans like termites so they can digest wood, or can they digest the cellulose themselves? Hmm. That is a great question. I'm trying to think. I know I've read about this, uh, but I can't recall right now. My my uh, first reaction would be that they probably do have the gut flora that helps them digest it, uh, but I don't want to, you know, just misstate something because I, I I can't quite recall at the moment. But that that's that's my impression that they do awesome. maintain those bacterial flora. Then... My mic's off. Thank you. Um, <laughs> well, mine was we're off. We're so in the bad at doing that so today. We're two for two. Um, Gretel asked, "How many species?" Wait, no. Well, she did. Uh, she said that already. Wait, there was another one. Shoot, there was someone who said something about. Oh, someone said something about zebras. I'm gonna zebras. have to start doing. The... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Someone said something about <laughs> zebras. Oh, they said I want to set up my zen. Not zebras. Zenata in a bioactive. What species should they? I don't even know what a zanata is. That's a king snake. You saw one. Wow. You saw one last podcast. Wow. Okay. Um, okay. And then, what species should they use for that? Well, uh, if I, I'm not too familiar with that species of king snake, so is that one from a more temperate setup or a more desert setup? Yeah. So I believe it's an animal that lives at elevation. So it's going to be okay. More a montane setup kind of thing. Okay. Well, you got options there then, but I would still probably go because it's going to be decent ventilation. I would go with a Porcellione des Purinosis, a powder blue or other powder. I'm um, just because that, that seems to be the least trouble free. There are isopods that have been suspected of attacking herps uh, just because they're very protein driven. You'd want to avoid something like that, but you're safe with the powders. And I hope Zanata is one of the ones at elevation or else someone's going to correct me tomorrow. <laughs> Sorry, I'll correct guys, you I right know. now. So it's okay. <laughs> Um, and then slightly off topic, so we can either change or we can hop back to isopods. But Northwell Zoo asks, um, "Do you have? Did you have any long-term success with the velvet ants?" Okay. So if you don't know what velvet ants are, they're actually a wingless wasp. Uh, so they look like a giant ant. The females are wingless. The males have wings, but um, they're very furry, most of them, and bright, <laughs> brightly colored. So a lot of people who actually don't like bugs think they're cute because they're fuzzy. And they have bright colors. Some of them look like, uh, like little fuzzy cotton. You know, uh, some of them are fluffy white. Some of them are red or orange or yellow or different colors. Anyway, um, I have had some decent success with the velvet ants. Unfortunately, they don't breed very well in captivity, and that's a problem. And I, I, I'm not a big fan of keeping creatures that don't breed in captivity most of the time. Uh, but I have a cousin who's an entomologist and has tried to breed them and has failed. I mean, this is his specialty. Velvet ants are his specialty, and he's he has a hard time with uh, breeding them. He he hasn't had it happen yet, but I have had good success keeping them. But their lifespans are not incredibly long. They only live a couple of years. But I have one. Uh, I have two right now, and they seem to be going strong. So, um, yeah, they, they usually only have a captive lifespan of about two years, and. Um, I hope they don't become too popular because I don't want the wild populations to be, you know, diminished. Um, yeah, diminished too much. They are very common and there are something like 8,000 species of them in the world. And wow. um, they're all over the U S they're, they're extremely common in the right, uh, the right uh, habitat, but you know, anything can be over collected. So, and especially we have to be sensitive just because they are uh, it's, they breed by parasitizing other species of ground nesting bees and wasps. So replicating that in captivity is tough. So I'm never going to be collecting them in large quantities. <laughs> yeah. Just wow. So, I mean, I always wonder, cause it seems like inverts really people depend on wild caught animals. And is it, that's just because there's such like niche ways that they reproduce like that. I mean, what are and, the and triggers for, to get them to reproduce? Yeah. And that, that's the thing. It is a, it's a very, Velvet ants are very, very specific. I mean, it's they're kind of an extreme example because there's a lot of uh, 
inverts that can be captive bred and I most of the ones I keep can either be captive bred or I'm trying to get them there you know um, things like that but uh, I would say that velvet ants specifically they you would need to have a ground nesting bee or wasp species the one they parasitize you'd need to have the entire system of that uh, colony going because they need to go in there and find the, the cell and lay their egg in the cell so that they can parasitize the larva. I mean, it would have to be that specific. That's a lot. And what do you feed a velvet ant? <laughs> the adults are super easy to feed. They're nectar feeders. And so you can feed them sugar water, like a hummingbird, essentially. Uh, you can feed them beetle jelly. I like to give mine beetle jelly and they seem to love it. Or you can give wait, them- Wait, 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 what's beetle where, jelly? And where do you purchase <laughs> beetle jelly? Well, beetle um, juice. <laughs> Uh, bugsincyberspace.com is one great place to buy it. Uh, actually, in Asia, beetles are a huge thing, especially in Japan, as a hobby. And so they created these jellies that don't spoil and they're nutritious for the beetles and so on. And they ship them over here and you can use them. And so I buy mine from bugsincyberspace.com. And you basically, it's this little container. It looks like a condiment container, like for ketchup or whatever. Just peel it off. It smells like brown sugar or fruit, depending on which flavor it is. And you just set it in there and they will just nibble at it. And my desert beetles nibble at it too. And it's, it's a really good diet for them. It has protein and all kinds of nutrients in them. Is it? And it's, it's basic. I think it's uh, at least some of them are carrageenan gel based. And then they just put sugars and amino acids and different things in there. And it's super easy to use because as it dries out, you just hydrate it. It doesn't rot, doesn't attract bugs. It ironically enough, it attracts the bugs that you want to feed, but it doesn't attract things like uh, fungus nets. So it works really well. So like we could eat it? Um, most of them do say not for human consumption, but I did see a YouTube video where someone was eating it. I'm sure they, they just don't make it in like a commercial kitchen that's sanitary for human consumption. I'm sure, I mean, you could probably lick it and survive, yeah. Yeah, I did see a YouTube video where someone just took some and spooned it up and was eating it and talking about it as they ate it. <laughs> oh, I want to watch that. I got I want to know what beetle jelly tastes. These are like. like the little things that like you could that that may be normal for for people who are in that particular hobby but for us it's like very left field so that's yeah, I, I can understand that. Yeah, I'm not tasting anything we're giving to our snakes. <laughs> None of that's coming anywhere close to my mouth. Oh, I'm right there with you. <laughs> so so Darren, I think this is a a little bit of a transition here. So does he uh, speaking to you, uh, does Russ know if isopods are safe to use in arachnid enclosures? Certainly. Um, you do have to think about your particular situation, which species you're keeping together and that kind of thing. But there are a lot of people who keep isopods successfully as cleanup crews in with their tarantulas. So, yeah. And, and you know, that, that's not a blanket statement that I said every isopod species will work for every tarantula but or every other arachnid. Uh, people keep them with other arachnids such as uh, scorpions, um, they keep them with uh, other uh, various types of arachnids. Uh, I have kept them with my tailless whip scorpions, for example. And yeah, you, you can do it. They work pretty awesome. well. Awesome. Next question is from Make It Kate. She said, what are your thoughts about mites and cultures? Well, this has been my experience with mites. And by the way, hi, Kate. A lot of these uh, people who are uh, commenting, I, I recognize them. It's great to see that That's they're, awesome. they're coming. I did Cut post this on, on Instagram and Facebook and uh, YouTube and various places to have people come and watch your, your stream. So I'm we glad they're doing it. it. So thanks for joining in. And uh, okay, my experience was in the beginning, I had issues with mites, the green mites. And I think it might have been partly that I wasn't entirely dialed into the... Um, husbandry as well as I am now and that I was starting out with fairly small cultures and so on I feel like that once you get a really thriving culture of isopods going a few mites are not going to be a problem they really aren't and I haven't had huge problems with grain mites in my cultures since then um, I do see mites in there I don't think they're grain mites and they're not parasitic mites they're uh, some other type of mite that once in a while will show up especially in a culture when it's starting out but they never really cause an issue the springtails and isopods eventually outcompete them, and that's the end of that. So I, I haven't had a big uh, problem with it. Another thing, which is um, 
obviously a bunch of different things have different kinds of viruses and stuff like that. But I know that there's a, an isopod virus, right? So, I mean, where does that come from? Have you seen it before? Um, I have seen, I think, uh, there's. An, uh, are you talking about the aridovirus, maybe? Yes, the one that turns them blue, right? Yes, yes, that's the aridovirus. And depending on the color of the isopod, uh, the normal slate gray isopod turns kind of a beautiful bright blue color. And I, I think I've seen some of those in the wild. I fortunately haven't seen that in my collection. And it does, does tend to be fatal. I have read some really old posts about people who were trying to breed blue isopods back when the um, orange Porcelio scaber was a new thing and people were breeding those and trying to get, uh, you know, those into the hobby. They were also trying to breed a blue type. And that was apparently just the original virus and it obviously never took off because we don't have blue isopods in the hobby because it just kills them. And I think it turns some of the different colors. Like if a, an orange isopod gets it, I think they turn purple like a bright purple. That's what I've heard, but I haven't seen that, but I have seen some blue ones and I'm not sure. I believe that the uh, iridovirus is mainly spread by isopods eating other isopods. So they'll eat a dead one that's, uh, you know, passed on from the disease and then they will get it. That's my understanding. Well, wow. it's kind of like, uh, what is it? Mad cow. If you eat another human brain, you'll get, uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you'll get some type of disease. I forget what it's called. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. Don't eat your own kind, guys. Come on. Exactly. Exactly. And and isopods do tend to clean up. You don't tend to find a lot of dead isopods in your isopod enclosures unless there's a mass die-off because they will eat the, the dead ones. And I think what we were kind of surprised when we first started doing research that, I mean, most of these live like up to three years, right? A lot of them can. Yeah. And I think that does uh, vary from species to species. But yeah, they, they do have a decent lifespan. Okay, this might be a dumb question. Now I'm going to phrase it in a way that's not dumb. Okay. Maybe. <laughs> what do they do? Do they do they hibernate? What do they do during winter out there? Because I know, like, we can't ship in cold weather because they don't survive. So, like, what are they? I mean, I'm sure it's different across species. But what are they doing in winter? Right. Well, species that live in areas where it is very cold, they do essentially hibernate, yeah. And uh, I think a lot of them retreat fairly deep into the soil. But uh, I, don't, I haven't done a ton of research on that area, but I do know that uh, they, they have to because there's no way they would survive how cold it is where we are. I mean, when it gets down to, you know, six degrees Fahrenheit, uh, they're not going to be uh, able to survive unless they're doing something like that. And there are plenty of isopod species that are never exposed to those temperatures. But uh, so I, there are species that would not be able to handle that. But I've had isopod, I had an isopod uh, package with three different species in it uh a little over a year ago that got lost in the mail on its way here it had a heat pack and everything was appropriately packed superbly packed in fact but through no fault of the sender it got lost in the mail and i was getting tr the tracking as i would check the tracking it said oh it's delivered oh it's delivered uh three months ago before it had ever been sent and you know this it was the craziest tracking number i've ever seen and then finally a week late it got there opened it up it had been super cold outside. The heat pack was stone cold and I opened it up and all the ice pods were fine. <sighs> Completely fine. Wait, what? <laughs> and, and I think it is partly that they are, they are less sensitive in general. I mean, if they had been tropical ice pods, they would have been dead. But uh, a lot of them are pretty, pretty resilient, more resilient than people give them credit for, honestly, a lot of the time, not that we want to push it, you know, it's, it's good to be careful with them, but, um, a lot of them are, are fairly resilient. That makes me, uh, <laughs> well, I feel like me. maybe it's <laughs> like, cause I know at least with corn snakes, um, unfortunately, like they're not very heat tolerant, but they are very cold tolerant. Right. I mean, is there something to that as well in isopods? Definitely. Definitely. I'd rather have my isopods get a little too cool with the exception of certain tropical species and then get a little bit too warm cause they're more likely to die. There's just going to be less oxygen available to them and so on. And they, yeah. What's happening with our clowns then? <laughs> oh, that's Russ, not me. <laughs> so we've been having issues with our clowns surviving. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like, one, you, USPS sucks. That's number one issue is that USPS <laughs> does not deliver when they say they do most of the time. But like, I feel like we're packaging it 
maybe we should ask you, how do you package yours? Um, or mm -hmm. what's the best way to package? Because we've had issues with our clowns not surviving. Not surviving when you're shipping out. Mm -hmm. We're just saying, okay. Well, um, I, I would say with clowns, one thing they don't want to get too wet. And so if their packing material is a little bit too moist, that might actually be really bad for them. That legit, that could be what I'm doing. <laughs> I mean, it may not even be heat dependent. Because I mean, now the last few, I, I sent out dry um, because I kind of had an inclination of that because just doing more research. Um, mm -hmm. So that's what I've been doing. So we'll see how that kind of works out. Um, but yeah, I've been doing like heat pack and all that good stuff and insulated boxes and to no avail. So, I mean, that very well could be, could be the case. That, that might be it. Cause I've noticed with my, uh, clowns and it's been a couple, I don't know, maybe three years or something since I've started with them. And like I was telling you before, I had die offs at first, but they've been really doing really well for me. And all I do is I keep a little tiny sliver of their enclosure is their moist area and the rest of it's bone dry and they love it. Mm. They just absolutely love that. So it's never that they don't have a moist area. They always do. And that's really important, but it's, it's pretty small. And it, so there you go. Yeah. Kate, and Kate uh, asked what substrate we're shipping in. Uh, we're shipping in pretty much what Russ uses. It's wood pellets, uh, cocoa husk, or cocoa fiber. So I guess not exactly what Russ uses cocoa fiber and leaf litter. And then sphagnum on top, and it's usually okay. pretty moist, but probably too moist. <laughs> and so that is that sounds like a pretty reasonable substrate to ship them in. But uh, yeah, it just may be toning down the moisture, and if that's seeming to work for you, I bet that's what it is. That, that would be, that was my first my first idea. So, and I mean, we talked a little bit about heat, or you know, what kind of animals you can put in, what type of enclosures. So, I mean, what are your cultures generally at heat wise? Heat wise. Uh, it varies a lot uh, during, depending on time of year. And I think that's part of the problem with my uh, rubber ducky. So I've moved them to a warmer spot to see if that helps. And it does seem to be helping so far. Uh, but in the summer, my, my critter room where I have, you know, 80% of the critters in the house are there at least. Uh, there are, uh, it's about 78 in the summer. And it goes down to about 65 in the winter. And for most isopods, that's totally fine. You know, anywhere in there, and some of them can go a lot lower without any problems. Some of them can go significantly warmer without any problems. But that, I would say the sweet spot for most isopods that are kept in the hobby, somewhere in the 70s. And then there are a few that like it a little warmer, a few that like it a little cooler. Gotcha. And is there any type of um, seasonality to it? Meaning, like, do you see production stall or get heavier at any certain time of the year or temperature based? Yes. Yes. And that does depend on species with some of the species. It doesn't matter. I, mean, I feel like I could put them in my fridge and it's still be reproducing, but uh, like dairy cows are just amazing and they don't do not care what time of year it is. They're just going to reproduce like crazy. And there are other species like that too. But with, uh, for example, the clowns, they seem to like it warm. And so they're reproducing more in the summer. Uh, not that they don't, reproduce at all when it's cooler, but they seem to slow down. Same with dwarf whites. Dwarf whites just, I'm just producing loads of them in the summer. And then in the winter, it really kind of tapers off a little bit just because it's cooler in the, the room. Um, those are probably some of the more extreme examples. Uh, there are some seasonality with, there's some seasonality in uh, reproduction with some of the Spanish giant Porcelio species like Porcelio magnificus and Porcelio Hoffman's agai. They seem to like produce a couple of clutches, you know, maybe two or three clutches in the summer and then kind of stop for a while. And, uh, but Porcelio arnatus, another giant Porcelio species, it's just like the Porcelio labus and just produces all the time. So yeah, this, that's, that's so awesome. Good. As far as like you have isopods that are getting to a legitimate size where <laughs> stop it with that face. Just <laughs> I mean, how big exactly <laughs> oh, are, say, Hoffman's awesome. egg eye or, or the other, you know, giant isopods as you call them, the Porcelia? Um, they, they get pretty big. Um, I would say, and one thing to keep in mind is that um, most of the giant Porcelia look even bigger than they are. 
because they have really long antennae. And then on the terminal end, they have really long uropods, the males. The females have shorter uropods, but the males have really long uropods. So that adds to this, this impression of size. But uh, Hoffman's egg eye can get to around two inches, maybe a little bit less than two inches, um, including the uropods. I think there's some that may actually get bigger than that. Um, I don't have any mature males. Well, the thing to talk about isopods is that they're – they're reproductively mature at smaller sizes than their full adult size. Uh, so um, I have a reproductive population of Porcelia Hoffman's egg eye, but I don't think any that are maxed out right now. I've had maxed out ones that have been passed on. But um, yeah, probably approaching two inches in length. And then the, the Magnificus is about the same, but some people say it's bigger. I don't have any that are that big yet, although they're reproducing and I have tons of little babies in there but they tend to be wider so that they, they look bigger in that sense just because they have the girth as well as the length so yeah and there are some people i've talked to who are getting some chinese desert species that are bigger than that that are like two and a half inches maybe three. Oh and, yeah and there are some aquatic species too or semi-aquatic species of course there are aquatic species that are foot long uh but that live in the bottom of the ocean and people are I think more aware of those than they are some of the hobby isopods but the um, there's some semi aquatic like brackish species and so on that can get up to about three inches and that people are trying to keep and having mixed success with so is there some type of like contest who could find the biggest <laughs> species of isopod right now or what I, I think so I think people are trying to find out what the largest terrestrial species is that they can get going and the, the biggest ones that I've seen is that Chinese one. And I don't know, I, I don't know if it's really in the hobby yet or not. Uh, uh, as far as being widespread, I haven't seen it a lot, but I've seen pictures of it and uh, it's pretty big. So, I like but I think, I think people are excited about the largest one to see what they can find. Yeah. You like just saying Magnificus? I, not, I just like the name. I don't know if I ever want a crustacean that big in my house, but I like the name I feel Magnificus. Like for you, when they get that big, they turn into cockroaches in your head. Yep. <laughs> just the ones we saw at the show this weekend. I don't. I don't. Couldn't tell you what species it was. Hoffman's egg eye. Is that what we saw? Yeah, they yeah. look like just cockroaches. That's full on. I, I can kind of see that. Uh, they their body. There's something reminiscent about that with the antennae and so on. And uh, fortunately. My wife isn't too worried about it. She did ask that we never, ever, ever keep cockroaches of any kind. I totally get that. But we do have those ice pods. She allows those, even though they have some superficial resemblance to roaches. <laughs> well, she also allows, like, death feeding beetles and velvet ants. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the agreement was no tarantulas, no uh, cockroaches, and no... Nothing with medically significant venom. And I'm good with that. That works for me. So to me, the the fuzziness of the velvet ant actually reminds me of a tarantula. Because <laughs> they look see that. the fuzzy, the fuzzy looking nature of the tarantula. I'm like, oh no, I don't I think for some it's more endearing. For yeah. you, it's more creepy. <laughs> if you put that <laughs> color on a snake or <laughs> something else. Well, there's plenty of people that think snakes are creepy. I know. So. So, are there iso? I guess there's. I'm sure there's isopod people who are like, "Oh, snake never." Yeah, yeah, that's true. I I can never figure it out. Um, you you can never predict what's going to creep different people out. And it's it's kind of fun though. I mean, I you got to respect it because for me, uh, if there is something that's creepy, I guess it is uh, tarantulas. I I will hold a tarantula. I've, I've held them before. I think they're cool, but I get a little bit, a little bit nervous about it for whatever reason. It's yeah. the legs. <laughs> <laughs> Too many legs. Will you hold like a millipede or a centipede? Do you oh, like that? Yeah, I have, I have like six species of millipede and um, centipede. We do have a centipede. I won't hold one just because it could bite me, but uh, the millipedes. Yeah. Even in my, my daughters will hold millipedes. They're, they're totally into it. And yeah, I, I think millipedes are super cool. Some of those fast moving like centipedes are mm -hmm. super scary. I'm scared of them. Like get these things <laughs> away. Uh, but they're they're cool. But yeah. uh, it just yeah, it's kind of like tremors or you know, it's <laughs> something from a horror movie, but um 
but they're cool in their own right. But um, how do, obviously you kind of talked about how you could sex isopods a little bit before, but I mean, how exactly does reproduction happen? I mean, do you see them breed? Do you see them lay eggs? Um, okay. Well, let's, let's talk about that for a minute. Well, as, as I did mention, some isopods are sexable just by virtue of their uropods, but that's not a common thing among all types of isopods. It's really easy with the Spanish porcelio. The male has a long uropods, tends to have a longer body as well. And then the female has shorter uropods and kind of a squatter body. But with many isopods, it's really difficult to tell just by looking at them. And you have to turn them over and there's these structures called pleopods near on the terminal end of the male and that are mating organs. And that is a lot, that sounds a lot easier than it is because turning over an isopod and then getting it to stay still and then getting a decent look at it, <laughs> it's not that easy. Uh, but generally it's not a big deal because you're getting a colony, start a colony of 10, 12 or more, and you're gonna have males and females, not a big deal. Uh, as far as uh, the mating, you will witness mating behavior. Um, the, the male mounts the female, pretty predictable sort of way of reproduction. And then uh, the female, though, doesn't deposit eggs. She um, carries the eggs in a brood pouch on her underside. The, it's called a marsupium. And uh, that brood pouch will uh, take care of the eggs. There's kind of a fluid in there that maintains them and whatnot until they are large enough to leave that pouch. And in some cases, they'll leave the pouch and then go back in for a while, kind of like a kangaroo, until they're ready to do their thing. And then they, and they're called, now you'll hear many different pronunciations of this word, but it's M-A-N-C-A-E. Some people say monkey, some people say man, mankai, you know, all, all sorts of things. But that is the term for very small juvenile isopods. And so they'll show up, uh, they look like pale versions of the adults, typically. A lot of times they're fairly colorless. And then uh, they, they just, they, they're, since they're communal, you don't need to separate them or anything and you just uh, raise them. And I know you know this, but for the benefit of our listeners who may not know this, um that's how it works it's pretty easy yeah i mean that's so it's so awesome i mean i've i've seen pictures of people who have gotten you know the babies who now i want to call them monkeys because that sounds more fun <laughs> um you know on the female's belly pretty much and it just looks i mean amazing it's very very cool yeah i was uh, messing around with a macro lens the other day and uh, saw a female with the marsupium full of eggs. And I was thinking, how cool would that be if I were to, to get one where the, when the babies are, are exiting the pouch? I remember doing that as a kid, picking one up and then the babies start running around out of the pouch. Oh, wow, I was mesmerized. And so I'd love to get some close-up footage of that sometime. Yeah, and I think I'd, just this among so many other things is just why I feel like they're so both unique and endearing but also like just the, I never expected them for me to put in like fish food pellets and then them to come out and then like jump on top of it and kind of grab it in their little hands and like <laughs> their little hands. <laughs> those, 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 <laughs> their little their little hands. hands. <laughs> I'm like, that is adorable. I didn't know it that. is. It's amazing to watch them do that. And that's part of the reason I love dairy cows because they are always ready for a snack they, and they will, they have the probably the biggest feeding response of any isopod I've ever seen. Uh, that, that's part of what I think is so cool about dairy cows. And now I've seen of something that seems like kind of fighting in quotations. I mean, is it possible to, you know, have some isopods that don't agree with each other or have a culture that goes haywire because they don't get along for whatever reason or there's too many of them? Well, I've seen them squabble over, uh, territory a little bit. Um, I think it's most of the squabbles I've seen are over food and they don't seem to be serious. I've never seen them injure each other, but it looks like to me, from what I understand, some of the giant porcelio species actually do maintain a territory and will like battle it out a little bit. The males will. So that's kind of interesting. It's probably worth a little bit more research. I'm not sure if anybody's done a lot into that, but uh, it kind of makes sense that why they would you know, attain such a great size and why they would have the big antennae. They seem to, it, it looks to me like they're threatening each other with them. I'm, I'm not entirely sure that's what's going on, but they remind me of like little goats battling it out on a hillside or something. <laughs> no, I mean, people, I don't No, You have to look and just look at these. It's like a miniature little community <laughs> and they're all interacting and, 
Don't look it's at me. It's true. Like that. It's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, Dan asked a good question in the chat and mm -hmm. he was kind of asking like, can they get out of your enclosure in any way? Can they populate in your house? Well, uh, generally if the enclosure is properly set up, they're not going to escape. Uh, they're not particularly good. Most species are not particularly good at climbing smooth plastic. So as long as you make sure that you don't have, th this is something that happened to me and I realized the, the error, and I'm really careful about this now, but early on, if I put a ton of leaves in there and you have leaf stems or pieces of sticks or whatever they are that extend from the substrate all the way up to the corner of the enclosure, and then when you put down the lid, it kind of jams the enclosure open, some of them will just climb up that thing and just you know fall out. And of course, in a house as dry as mine, they're not gonna survive long, but you just lost you know, a lot of isopods because they dried out on your floor and that's not cool from any standpoint. So they're not going to establish in your house unless you have a very damp house. And if you, if your basement was, you know, a rotting mess of wood that would support isopods, then you probably have bigger problems than isopods uh, in your house. But uh, yeah, so it's unlikely that they would establish in your house, but they may well escape if you don't have the enclosure properly sealed. Well, Russ just described our basement. Yeah, so. I was about to say, uh, also our snake room, very humid. Uh, 1905 uh, Philly basement. It's uh, basically decaying. It's basically a sewer. It's what it, wow. it's what it feels but like. I like that. <laughs> I mean, it floods. It looks like a sewer. It's, yeah. <laughs> well, you might not want to let any ice pods right down into that area then. Yeah. Well, we'll no. We'll do our best. We, we They're a couple our, floors away. We have our mice down there. The mice interact with how would that go how i'm guessing mice would eat isopods i bet they would eat isopods yeah okay i could imagine almost anything would eat an isopod <laughs> yeah yeah so many things will um i've often thought that there's some like some of the marine or the larger puffer fish would eat some of our larger isopods it'd be nice crunchy food for them so but you can raise toads on a staple diet of isopods for example and they're nutritious and healthy for a lot of lizards we, uh, when our crusty gecko was little, we would give her ice pods and she crunched them up and she loved them. We don't really do that anymore, but she's kind of retired from eating bugs mostly. She'll take one occasionally, but uh, she mostly just likes her crusty gecko diet because she's like five years old. And, you know, she doesn't care anymore. And can we talk a little bit about like the differences between say Porcilio or like Armadillidium? I mean, I've seen, or Cubaris, who I've seen go into like a super tight ball Mm -hmm. and stuff like that, kind of the different defenses and kind of how they work in comparison to each other. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a really fascinating thing to look into, really, because you have uh, independent groups of isopods that have adapted to be able to form this ball, and some of them are different shapes, like Armadillidium and Cubaris are a really tight one, like you were mentioning. And then there are other species, like uh, Silisticus convexus is a species I have that uh, rolls into a teardrop shape instead of a instead of a ball. Okay, now I have to uh, look that up. But there's no, but I way. There's spell no it. <laughs> way I'm spelling that right. So, kiss <laughs> convectus. Silisticus. Can I spell that without looking at it? Um, maybe. <laughs> it's C-Y-L-I-S-T-I-C-U-S. Silisticus. I hope I said that right. You can't type that fast. <laughs> <laughs> Convexus. There you it. go. Google uh, finished it off for us. Oh, but I need a picture of them rolled up. Darn it. Darn it. Type rolled up. <laughs> and you do you do have to look kind of close to see the difference, but if you do, it's it's pretty cool. Oh, Google failed us. There's and they look kind of like the in-between of like armadillidium and a porcelia or something. They, like that. Yeah, yeah, that I think that's a good good way to explain it. And then there uh when you look at a porcelia, a lot of the porcelia when they are threatened they will become immobile and sort of kind of curl their body, but it's not even into a C shape. It's just sort of like a, uh, like a canoe shape almost, but they will stay extremely stiff and still in, in that position. And you can kind of see where this all came from. Okay. That doesn't look like a teardrop to me, but I don't know. If that... Yeah. That's not a great picture of it. You can't really tell it, it from certain angles. You can see it better than others, but. Sounds like you're nuts. It's Instagram post. <laughs> 
There you go. And it seems like there's really not much knowledge of a lot of these, at least in captivity. I mean, where has it come from when you first started to seven years later? Oh, there's there's so much more information. Uh, there's like you say, there's still a lot we don't know about isopods. But in terms of like the different species that exist, even even then, I mean, in the hobby, there were maybe half a dozen species, and I think I'm probably being generous when I started uh, in the U.S. I mean, I think in in Europe at that time they were already breeding a lot of the giant Spanish porcelio and so on. And shortly after that time is when I became aware of like the giant Spanish Porcelio. And I started contacting people because uh, there were people who wanted to ship them over here, but I didn't want to do it without the proper permits and so on. So I started contacting APHIS and Fish and Wildlife and so on. I was asking about it and I was saying, this is what I want to do. What do you think about it? And they'd say, well, we don't, I think you should talk to this other person. They'd give me a number and I'd call that person and talk to them. And they gave me a run around for a while. Um, you know, they were trying to be nice. They were all nice about it but they didn't quite know where, what to do with me or what I was trying to do, actually. I don't think they quite understood. And so I kind of gave up on that and I figured, well, they're eventually gonna make their way over here. And they did. But you know, that was a number of years before they actually got here in, to the popularity that they have now. But in terms of all the species that people are aware of, in terms of uh, the morphs that are available, the species we do know about, and in terms of just the widespread nature of good husbandry for them, we've come uh, a long way. And it's, it's kind of weird to describe husbandry of it. Cause it's, I mean, it seems rather simple and straightforward, but I mean, is there any way that um, I'm trying to think, is there any way that you could like set these up display like as pets? Cause I know, at, I mean, at this point there's so many beautiful versions and color phases and stuff. Um, going on and ones that don't even seem suitable for bioactive vivariums. And um, right. I mean, can you set them up like as a display pet? You certainly can. And it does depend on the species because there are some species you could set up in a, in a perfectly beautiful enclosure and you'd never see them. Uh, like uh, Porcelio dilatatus, the giant canyon isopod. As soon as you open the enclosure, they just, you know, they burrow themselves down as far as they can. They hate, you know, any kind of, disturbance and and that would be kind of pointless but with something like dairy cows you're going to see them essentially 24 7 milling around the enclosure doing their thing and there are other species too uh, like the zebra pill bug is one of my favorite species for that they they tend to be pretty visible during the day uh, and there there are quite a few others as well actually the powders uh, are pretty good for that as well so yeah you can totally do that and there are enclosures that people sell that are primarily uh, display enclosures for isopods like uh, I did uh, an unboxing of an Isoviva enclosure uh, a few months ago. And I put my, I've been isolating some, what I think are the same mutation as Oreo crumbles, but they just spontaneously showed up in my um, uh, powder blue bin. And I've been separating them into that and they're breeding in there. And it's a really nice looking enclosure. It's clear acrylic. It has vents built into it. And it comes with, you can either get it plain, empty and fill it up yourself or it comes with isopod substrate and bits of wood and leaf litter and moss and the whole business, everything you need to take care of them. And I think that's, you know, a lot of people are going that direction because if you want a display setup, that's a good way to go. But there are also people who just set up an aquarium as a terrarium and, and keep the isopods in there and that works great too. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, in your opinion, do you think a majority of people out there interested in isopods are interested um, for pets or as for bioactive enclosures? Well, I've noticed a shift in that over the past few years. The shift has been towards uh, the hobby aspect of it, keeping them as pets. Not that there aren't plenty of people who do both. I do both. I think a lot of people do. And I think a lot of people who are in the reptile hobby um, get into it from the bioactive clean up crew aspect and then, you know, kind of shift over. And so they're doing both. Uh, so I think uh, the trend is that it's more, more popular as pets than it used to be, but I don't think the, the cleanup crew aspect is dying down. In fact, I think it's growing along with the rest of it. They're just both growing. 
Yeah, and I guess as a whole, it seems like more and more people are going towards, whether it's reptile, amphibian keeping, like naturalistic setups and bioactive vivarium. So it seems like this is kind of just the beginning of all of this. I think so. And it's been amazing to see at expos, you know, just a few years ago, you go to an expo and you're going to see dwarf whites, maybe giant orange, and it's only going to be a handful of people who keep them. The last expo I was at back in September, we usually have them twice a year here, and there were so many people with ice pods. Um, I had ice pods, but there were tons of other people who had all these different species of ice pods everywhere. It was it's it's really growing, and I heard some somebody said this is like the next ball, ball python craze, and, wow. and maybe 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 it's true. Uh, there are so many people who are getting into it, and it just seems a natural fit for so many reptile keepers. Uh, because it's connected. A lot of people are interested, not everybody, but a lot of people who are interested in one are interested in the other. Right. Yeah. And we have, we already have the sickness of wanting to collect things. <laughs> and even, you know, even if you have one species, you want it in this color phase, that color phase, this kind of thing. And right. Yeah. And, and uh, a lot of those same attractions too, uh, in, in terms of uh, like uh, husbandry, so easy to keep isopods. If you have a reptile room and you have a little bit of shelf space, you can have, you know, 15 different types of isopods right there and hardly have to worry about it. Yeah. And if you're, and if you're like me and you have a snake room that's kept at like 80 degrees, it seems to even be better. I mean, it seems like mine reproduce rather quickly and do well, you know, at the higher temperatures. Right. And, and a lot of them really do speed up at the warmer temperatures. Uh, Lance from the chat asks, can you put peace lilies, dead leaves in bioactive in cages? Um, he'd love to give it to the bugs, but he understands that it's poisonous. Hmm. No well, idea what he's talking about. a couple things. I know what you're talking about with peace lily, like the spathophyllum species of peace lily, I think is what you're talking about. Um, they're the ones that you may have seen in the little betta jars. That was a crazy, it's kind of an unfortunate situation. They put the, the fish down in the jar and have the peace lily coming out of the top. Some of you may have seen those in like Walmart or something. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that's the plant I think you're talking about. I don't know uh, about that particular species, whether or not it would be a problem. But I do know that isopods will often eat leaves that are poisonous when they're fresh once they have died. That a lot of those toxins are no longer a danger to the isopods. For um, some of the leaves that are like walnut leaves are not particularly good for isopods. They do have toxins in them when they are dry. But... Um, isopods will eat them when they're dead. And there are some people, there's difference. It's kind of a controversial leaf as far as isopods go. But I've read, I've read some scientific literature on that, that particular leaves that they will avoid when they're green, they, they can eat when they're dry and it's, it's safe for them. I'm not saying that this is necessarily true with peace lily, but I, I would say that um, a dry leaf is probably safer than a, a recently dead one. Is there anything that's really like taboo when it comes to keeping uh, isopods? I mean, for us, for reptile keepers, I mean, don't use a hot rock. I mean, that's pretty taboo or, you know, some things that are just straight up outdated. Is there anything like that? Any little things to avoid as uh, keeping isopods? Well, that is a good question. I'm trying to think. Um, most people are really pretty careful about, um, you know, pesticides on produce. I think that is a, is a very valid concern you don't want to introduce pesticides in there. Um, people worry about mites, like, uh, was it Make It Kate, I think, who brought that up. Um, mites, people freak out when they see mites in their enclosure, and they really are annoying to deal with. But, uh, so I think that's that's one of them. And I'm trying to think of what else. Um, fungus, visible fungus. I mean, in a healthy ice pot enclosure, there are going to be various types of fungi growing in there, and it's just part of the system. You know, but if you see for example, a mushroom sprout out of your ice pod enclosure. That, that can worry people, and with good reason, because some of those could be toxic to humans and or to the ice pods. Um, I haven't had trouble with any toxic ones, although in my earlier isopod keeping, I did have some, uh, some mushrooms actually grow in enclosures, and I got worried about it. And that was part of the reason I stopped using the, the cocoa fiber, but I think um, also dialing into other aspects of husbandry, better ventilation, that kind of thing helped with that as well. Awesome. And I mean, I know for me, I've had, I've had my sweet potatoes start growing. Yes. I yeah. that too. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. It's like, you know, you put, a, I guess, a little bit too big of a sliver of a sweet potato and then all of a sudden a week later, it's, uh, it just starts growing. Yep. 
Yep, I've definitely seen that. <laughs> um, are there trends in like the isopod mar- isopod market with like certain species, like similar? Oh, like to, things get popular, right? 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 Do things just like blow up and all of a sudden, and then like all the isopod breeders start focusing on this one species, and then it gets saturated? Like, does that kind of happen in the isopods, like it does in snakes? To some extent, yes. I would say that um, it's interesting because isopods don't reproduce at the same rate as, you know, they're, they're definitely be able to produce a lot more isopods in a year from a, a couple of isopods than you would from snakes. I mean, right. they're, they, they're pretty prolific and some species are crazy prolific, but uh, I would say that in terms of invertebrates, they're actually kind of slow compared to some other things like roaches or, you know, things like that. So uh, people they don't saturate quite as quickly as some other things would. Um, but they do, they do get there. And I've noticed, I saw the big push when the Spanish giant porcelio came out and they were the rage and they're still really popular and they're still fairly expensive. I mean, they have, they've come down in price, but they haven't come down a lot. I mean, still you're, you're paying more than a dollar for most species of the giant porcelios. Um, individually, you know, individual isopod, but then the cubaris, the rubber duckies first, and then a lot of the other cubaris species hit the market and now they're the big thing. And they'll probably be the big thing for a while because they take a while to reproduce. Uh, they, they do reproduce pretty well. There's no barrier per se to having them reproduce in captivity, but they're just not the fastest reproducers. And so they haven't gone down in price and have actually gone you know, they, they fluctuate a bit. You see them go down a little bit and then up. And then, so they, they really haven't stabilized all that well yet. And there are so many new species being discovered, as we were mentioning before, which can be a bad thing because some of these are from very limited uh, Supply. habitats. Yeah, they, mm-hmm. they're, they're native to one cave system and that's it. Mm. And so if we're not breeding them in captivity, well, then we're doing some serious damage to their um, native populations. And so we need to be careful about that. But yeah. I have seen that happen. And uh, initially it was with things like um, Porcelio scaber morphs and then the um, giant Spanish Porcelio and now the Cubaris. The rubber duckies were one Joe had to really work to convince me. I still don't fully understand how okay, it anything could be that expensive. I have like, 12 and I... I like try to dig a little bit just to see them. I haven't seen them since we bought them, and it freaks me out. I'm like, I don't yeah. know. Where Do you not are. tell me that. Those are so expensive. <laughs> I'm like, damn. I hope you're alive in there somewhere. Yeah, when you spend uh, twenty dollars in a piece, or twenty five, or thirty on on isopods a piece, you really don't want them to die off. And I did, unfortunately, with my rubber duckies, experience some die off, and that was really sad. And that's, it's not terribly common to happen with, you know, isopods are generally pretty hardy, but, and I, I didn't lose them all, but I did lose enough that it really worried me. So. Yeah. And I I keep, I keep the wild type and it's like, yeah, I don't think for one second about those and they do great. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. But rubber duckies. Are rubber duckies more of a burrowing species than other types? That a thing? Mine tend to hang out on limestone a lot. I've got some chunks of limestone in there, and that's where they spend most of their time. And they're like crevices and little cavelets inside the limestone, so they go in there. Huh. Sounds like I'll you need, need to get some, some cuddle bone and see if they'll go to it. Could be, yeah. I, I ended up getting my limestone from a, an aquarium store because they sell the base rock for marine aquariums, and it has all the holes in it and everything. And it's uh-huh. not that expensive. Um, I think they maybe gave me the pieces free because they were so small compared to the pieces they usually sell. And so is that a viable the calcium source? For, for rubber duckies and other cave-dwelling Cubara species, yeah. Just soak it in fresh water first to make sure you leach out any possible salt contamination. Then you can do that. Oh, that's awesome. So they can, like, chew rock? <laughs> yeah. And limestone is a pretty soft rock in general. So, yeah, they seem to be able to do it, and they seem to benefit from how? interacting with that. How? Do, how? <laughs> Seems well, so fragile. Have you ever had an isopod, I'm, Melissa, I'm pretty sure you haven't had this happen, but Joe, maybe you have had an isopod nibble on you. 
No, no. And I heard you say that in a video and I was like, I don't know if I'm happy that hasn't happened or not. I, it might feel weird. I'm if, not sure. If that ever happens to Melissa, something's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was figuring you, something's wrong with me. I was figuring you'd probably avoid that situation, uh, yeah. that potential situation. But if if I stick my hand into, say, um, Porcelio scaber or Porcelio ornatus, those are the species I've noticed it with. There are probably others that would do it too. But if if I stick my hand in there and they're hungry, they haven't eaten yet that day, they will crawl into my hand and it doesn't hurt at all. But you feel these tiny little, like scraping movements on your hand. And it's, it's, you know, it's not painful at all. They don't take anything off, but it's, it happens. Uh, I may have been chewed on and not even knew it. That's very possible. You have to kind of be paying attention to it. It's, it's pretty subtle. And I guess. So they're not really like biting it then. They're just like scraping at it. Scraping at it. Yeah. And when they're scraping at limestone on a microscopic level, they're probably just little, you know, particles sticking off. that are easy enough to just. Kind of scrape off and collect. Yeah. <laughs> My sucking but, up of the particles. <laughs> and they are able to eat, you know, powdered eggshell and things like that. So they can they can manage that. And I've heard of people, I know this sounds kind of gross, but people taking fingernail clippings and throwing them in, they'll eat those. <laughs> <laughs> and and as uh obviously I've done I've done snake sheds as well. And mm -hmm. um I, I guess something that people always seem to uh, to bring up especially like if we're at shows we have some isopods they're like what will the isopod eat my pet basically or pick on my snake or amphibian right and and i think that is with invertebrates other invertebrate pets that's definitely a concern if you keep you know most invertebrates have a very vulnerable molting period or many of the pet invertebrates we have will have this molting period with, during which they're very soft and vulnerable and so Isobuds have been known to, say, eat a molting millipede if you keep them with them and, and other, you know, other species that molt like that. And fortunately, reptiles are a little more durable that way. They shed their skin and they actually have a skin that's ready to go right under it, which is nice. So I think there's less of an issue that way. I have heard of people saying, well, this isopod ate my pet. And I don't really know what to think about that, honestly, because... How many times do we have documented cases of it where there's photographic evidence of it? And um, how, do, how often do we know that if it did, if they did eat it, that it was actually alive when they attacked it? So I would love to get uh, more documentation on that. I just, I think that's important before we make a conclusion. Not that I want people to experiment, but if just people do have a situation where, yes, this happened, my snake was healthy this day and the next day, I had a skeleton that was being eaten by 4,000 isopods. You know, that kind of thing. Um, it, it would be interesting to, to have more information on that topic because I think there's a lot of room there for error and a lot of room there for more discovery. Yeah, and that's something that, I mean, I hope that I'm able to keep more snakes in that fashion. And, I mean, for me, it seems like it would be kind of hard for me to believe that this armor-plated pretty much reptile that has, you know, evolved this defense. I mean, I, I find it hard to believe that an isopod would do any damage to them, but who knows, maybe in the ocular scale, maybe in the corners of the eyes, they could get something. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's important not to discount it. Yeah. Because who knows, but I do find it difficult to believe myself. And, but if I would never throw, for example, a reptile into my uh, dairy cow enclosure, because I think, there are enough in there that it could be a, an actual problem. And, and they're pretty tough and they'll eat things like I'll throw shrimp skeletons in there. The other day we had shrimp pad thai for dinner and I took all the shrimp tails and tossed them into my isopod enclosures and the dairy cows just <laughs> ripped that pile of uh, shrimp tails up. And it, you know, it's pretty tough chitin. It's not exactly the same thing as keratin, like a snake scale, but it's, it's a similarly tough biological uh, material and they just ripped right through it, it was gone. Yeah, so, yeah, they, it's you could see that the potential, you know, there is some potential when you see a swarm of little ice spots. I also like when, like, sometimes if I turn on the lights and they're swarming, and then some will just dissipate immediately and like retreat, mm -hmm. which I find to be pretty interesting as well. Right, and it's interesting how different species will do that more readily than others. 
and like the dairy cows will almost not care that you have a light on and like they but some of them will just scatter instantly and you won't see anything so so let's talk a little bit about your beetles i mean what okay. do you have going on over there yeah yeah um well blue death fanning beetles are a desert species of beetles native to the southwestern united states and down into mexico they are native to my state um and they are really fascinating because one they're blue and they're blue because they have this waxy secretion that protects them from the sun and um it so it can rub off but it'll just grow back because they continually secrete it and so they have this kind of ghostly blue color to them it's really fascinating a little bit like a powder blue eye spot i guess and um they are really interesting because they are extremely resilient it's they can live up to 17 years they've had a case of uh, <laughs> one in captivity living 17 years they can go for months without food or water they've actually had them in space because they knew that they could withstand the experiments the duration of the experiments uh, because they were in space for that long without food or water uh, wow. because they can survive so long that's um, why <laughs> they will eat almost anything in the wild their their main food tends to be uh dried insects that they find but they'll eat plant matter too so they're very very adaptable that way and the only thing is until fairly recently they would they couldn't crack the code on getting them to reproduce the entire life cycle in captivity because they would lay eggs, no problem. The eggs would hatch into the larvae. Sometimes some people could get the larvae to, to grow and get them to a respectable size, but right around two inches long, they would die. They couldn't get them to pupate. That was where the cycle would break. And, uh, but not too long ago, there was a man named Dean Ryder who was sequencing the genome of these beetles actually. And so he, you know, had an interest, a vested interest in producing them. And he cracked the code. He figured out they need to be incubated at a warm temperature. Uh, as as a, a mature larva needs to be incubated around 88 degrees. It can be a little cooler, a little warmer. And at about 75, 80% relative humidity, and they will pupate. And he was able to produce beetles that way. And Those are ball python eggs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little like that. And so... Uh, this was not something people had really thought of, but it worked for him. Cincinnati Zoo has since uh, produced them as well. At least one. I think they've only produced one so far. And so I decided to uh, try it myself. And I have able, I've successfully produced a number of larvae. And I have a, a number of those larvae that are approaching the size at which I can incubate them. So I have a hover baiter ready to go. It's already set to 88 degrees. And in the next few weeks, I'll be popping some in there. See how it goes. Wow, what is what is I guess I'm calling it an egg box. I guess it's a larvae box. I mean, what do you put them in? So basically just the substrate that I keep them on with uh to to produce larvae. So a sandy substrate with things like a little bit of leaf litter, a little bit of compost in there for nutrients. So they have something to eat. And I do give them things like cat food and so on for additional protein and bits of carrots for hydration and that sort of thing. So that's what I keep them in, and that's essentially what I'm going to be incubating them in. Probably some cocoa fiber to throw in there as well. And can we talk a little bit about the defense or lack there of defense? <laughs> <laughs> I'm judging by the name. Ah, yeah, yeah, totally. Um, so a lot of beetles that are in this family, this family of beetles is a really huge family, and they have lots of different ways of defending themselves. Some of them spray their enemies with uh, uh, repugnatorial fluid, like a skunk would kind of thing and those I can collect just over here um, just a few minutes walk from my house I can collect that particular species of beetle uh, but this species is so desert adapted that they're they don't want to let go of fluids because they need to be able to survive long periods without intake of water and so um, they've lost the ability to spray but instead when they are bothered they will freeze completely and look dead and they'll, they can lie on their back and sit there for uh, minutes or even hours looking as dead as a doornail, not moving at all. And then when things calm down, they just flip right over. And you may have seen it in some of my videos where they do that, where they're just looking completely dead and then they'll just pop right over and walk off as if nothing had happened. And I guess the idea is that predators like a roadrunner, for example, would come and they'd grab the beetle and it's so heavily armored that it might bounce and just land somewhere and not moving, the, the roadrunner would not be able to locate it again because it's not moving at all. 
That's always such an inter- interesting defense mechanism to me because I feel like so many animals would benefit from that. And in my head, like my evolutionary little small part in my part in my brain that thinks about evolution wonders like why some more than others when I feel like so many would benefit from that like trait. Right, right. And there are, and I've read some interesting things on the, the trait and you know, we, we call it death feigning, but there are some hypotheses out there that I mean, a lot of people favor the term tonic immobility rather than feigning death because they're not sure what the, all the mechanisms are that, you know, the, the causative mechanisms behind it, if they're actually attempting to feign death or if they're attempting to do something else, or if this is a stress response that they just have no control over the, the stiffening and it doesn't actually, it's not necessarily a survival benefit in the sense that we think it is. There's a lot of speculation on that. And I mean, there's those feigning goats, which I heard, I mean, James was telling us that's actually a gene that's bred for. It's not even like that's what happens in the species. Like that's bred for by breeders to pass on the fainting gene. Exactly. Yeah. I've heard about that. That's, that's quite bizarre. I'm not sure that I would care to breed a variety of goats that I could cause to faint by screaming at them or whatever. I don't know. That's, uh, (laughs) sounds a little cruel, but that's just, yeah, yeah, exactly. But it, it is, it does seem to be widespread enough among so many different species that there must be survival advantages in many cases to be able to do that. Absolutely. So do you, do you have to do anything to like stimulate breeding or with these guys? Yes, you, you do have to keep them on a, a substrate that's likely to um, result in not only it's, Egg deposition is probably just going to happen as long as they feel like they're warm enough, they're getting enough food. Uh, it's more of an issue of getting providing a substrate that's deep enough and moist enough in some areas and yet dry enough in others. That if you get the beetles too humid, it's really bad for them. They can die. But if the eggs dry out, the eggs will die. And so if you provide a moisture gradient in the enclosure, so I put mine in a 20-gallon long uh, with a moisture area. I put a rocky area, and then I would just – kind of um, wet down that area a couple times a week and the other area was bone dry and so the beetles could maintain their low humidity needs but they would go lay eggs in that other corner and then I would just go through and sort out larvae because uh, they the larvae can't survive in a bone dry enclosure they the eggs may hatch and survive a little while but they'll just die and the adults will sometimes eat the babies or the eggs and the larvae will eat each other if there's too much of a size difference and so I would go through and sort out larvae and separate them into jelly cups and, and I keep them all separately now to avoid that. So, um, so many people I think have the mindset in an invertebrate keeping kind of like with isopods, you put isopods in a container, you take care of them, you feed them, they will breed. And it's sort of an inevitability. And w- with these beetles, you have to take care of all these different things, uh, and make sure they're not eating each other and, and so on and providing different temperatures at different parts of the life cycle. So it's a much more complicated, uh, situation and, and that's why it's been maybe so difficult to, for people to figure out. And are these, I mean, it seems like you created a nice little display for them and it seems like they're not awfully shy. They, they aren't very shy. And uh, if you have a decent number of them, especially, and you can mix species, which is nice if you just want to do a display enclosure. When I'm actively breeding them, I keep the blue death fainting needles by themselves. No other species in there. But right now I'm not producing eggs per se. I'm waiting till the summer. I'm going to start that again. But I am raising the larvae. But while I'm doing that, I have the adults with other desert beetles and with the velvet ants. And they all coexist peacefully. And having all those different species in there really increases the likelihood that somebody's going to be active at any given time. And all of those species tend to be really active in the evening and in the morning hours. So um, when I go in there in the evening, it's just... uh, a flurry of activity in there and it's it's really cool to see and during if i come in there say on lunchtime on a weekend i might see one or two and that's cool but uh the evening is when they really shine and do they go to their bowl of beetle jelly and both <laughs> take nibbles at the same time like uh like a, they, and a lion or something they, they totally do the other day i posted on my instagram um I, I just set some beetle jelly down and waited a couple of seconds. And I said, who's going to be first? And uh, then this, this big uh, black um, 
desert clown beetle came and started eating and then the velvet ant came up and started eating. They're all eating at the same time. So that's, you know, you get to see the interaction and sometimes they will, they don't damage each other, but sometimes they'll bump up to each other and then they're like, whoa, what do I do? And they'll uh, scramble away and it's, it's kind of funny. Or one will mount the other one and realize, oh, no, you're a wrong species, never mind. And, and leave. And <laughs> it's kind of funny. So are beetles, I mean, is that their own section of the hobby as well? I mean, is that its own group as well? It is. It is. There's a really, uh, in, in Asia, I think I may have mentioned before, in Asia, beetles are, oh, there's one of the, the posts that looks like my post. I think it's, yes, I've got it some is. glare, but cool. Yeah. And that's uh, a, a different post that I did a couple of days afterward, just one of these blue death thinning beetles eating some jelly. And this actually turned out to be a pretty popular post. It was kind of fun. Um, oh, it's one of both. Okay, sorry. Oh, there's the one with both. Yeah, there's the the uh, uh, desert clown beetle and the velvet ant eating. <laughs> I don't want to be like eat the ant. But but beetles are a really big thing in Europe and in Asia. There are some laws governing which species we can keep here, and you know these are are pretty safe to keep in the U.S. But there's some crazy beetles from outside the US that are totally illegal to keep here, at least unless you have special permitting. And they're huge and they're beautiful and so on, but um, it's very limited what we can keep here uh, in terms of some of those. But in, in Asia, in Europe, there are there's a really robust beetle hobby. Do you have any interest in like the, it seems like the rhinoceros beetle is the one that everyone's interested in? They are beautiful. And there are some species that are native here that we can keep. And I would be interested in keeping some of those at some point. Yeah, definitely. What's the beetle? Who was talking about it? John? The Paul? Ringo? What? <laughs> the beetle who was on the podcast recently and it was a really gross one. Yeah, that is the rhinoceros. Well, yeah, rhinoceros beetle. But we were looking at something. Okay, never mind. I don't remember what I'm talking about. <laughs> Yeah, the R and B one we talked about so different. Uh, yeah, some different we watched some video about it or something like. And uh, I mean, I have no reference for these. I mean, how much does a beetle cost? Like, how much is the most <laughs> expensive beetle out there? Is it some outrageous? Oh. Well, in for beetles in the U.S., like some of those rhinoceros beetles you're talking about, um, a larva, one single larva, might cost thirty, thirty-five dollars. Um, even I've seen some maybe for 60 or so, uh, if it's, if it's a mature beetle that's ready to reproduce, maybe like $60 a beetle. And, and those, those are the native ones in, in Europe. Some, I think they go for more for some of the exotic ones, but you know, can't get them here, but yeah, it's, it's not a small price. And the funny thing is that if you get a rhinoceros beetle larva, you're not going to see it very much. You have to provide it with a very, very high quality substrate. You're not going to see it very much until it pupates and then becomes an adult and then they don't live very long. So you got to make sure you have males and females at the same time if you want to keep things going. So do most people sell them in the larval stage? Yeah, that's usually when they're sold. Um, but they do sell the adults too. And then most of them are, are worth money as, as dead stock for insect collections. A lot of times they're worth more dead. So wow. once they die, people will sell off the, the dead ones. <laughs> That is interesting. And is there like captive? I mean, there must be captive breeding if people are selling larvae, right? There is. There is. It's kind of a, a niche, I guess. But yeah, it's, I mean, within the insect hobby, it's it's a fairly popular one. I'd say that someone was saying this the other day, that uh, tarantulas, beetles, I think it was Peter at Bugs in Cyberspace, saying tarantulas, beetles, and now isopods are like the three big arms of the uh, bug hobby, so to speak. Yeah, and isn't it? I mean, it's kind of crazy that something that I mean has been under our noses for so long, an isopod, has made such a splash, and it's even going beyond you know the invertebrate hobby. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It is. It's really an interesting phenomenon, and I think it, it comes back to some of the things we've been talking about. Their their care is so easy, and then there's just this satisfaction you get from. All, what they do, watching them, and just you have, having them maintaining this little colony that is is contained, and and doesn't you don't have to worry about separating things when you're breeding and all that stuff. And there's so much variety, so I think it appeals to people on so many levels. And there are plenty of people who 
are repulsed by other invertebrates and are perfectly happy with isopods. Yes, it's a good it's a good middle ground, I guess, for probably introducing people, you know, to that kind of creature. I right. can definitely handle them more than if you ever brought a tarantula in here. <laughs> Things would change. Yeah, I think you would get along with my wife well, Melissa. I'm pretty <laughs> sure. <laughs> I think I just always try to explain them as like more of a land crab to her, <laughs> more so than a bug. It's just still, I envision like laying, I have this weird like thing in my head, like laying on this like flat surface and them just crawling all over. And I'm sure people have that with snakes. And for some reason, I don't have that in my brain. I have that of these just like crawling all over me. And now after this podcast, I also think of them basically exfoliating me while crawling all over me and, maybe <laughs> and it doesn't really help. But I, yeah, but I think that, you that is an rub, unsettling image. You should rub some beetle jelly on your face and let them. <laughs> and then crawl all over yes. Me. I think that would exfoliate <laughs> beetle jelly. Oh. We learned so many new things. But today. the fact that I haven't seen one escape yet, also, we've been keeping, you've been keeping them for a very long time. Now, if the springtails ever escape, I'm probably never going to even oh, see Oh, what it. do you that's, mean? They're, that's literally, I never see that. I pour I've, them out and they <laughs> escape, but I don't know. <laughs> but I never see that. But I haven't seen an iso, a lone isopod anywhere. So that makes me happy. Yeah, they, a good job. They, they are pretty innocuous that way, fortunately. And now, I mean, I guess for the last minute, let's talk about what snakes you have. So you got corsair <laughs> starters. Is there anything else that, that you're hiding over there? Let's see. Snake-wise specifically, I only have that one hypomelanistic corn snake and then the three red-sided garters, um, two males and a female. They're juveniles, and I'm really excited to have them. Um, it's the first snake I'm going to be trying to breed. Uh, and so, though, of course, they're all juveniles now, but uh, I just set up their bioactive enclosure and in about maybe a year and a half or so, I, I might be breeding them. I hope so. Uh, I, once again, this, this whole idea, I find that I gravitate towards communal species of various types, like isopods. Like I have a, a tank full of Tanganyikan shell dwelling fish that all live inside snail shells and they, they populate the whole enclosure, you know, the whole tank um, in these little territories they maintain. And with the snakes, I'm just excited about. Uh, being able to keep snakes communally and and watch them just uh, do their thing diurnally, so they're you know they're active in the vivarium. You get to watch them, not like a snake that's going to be burrowed and hidden all the time. Are those bioactive vivariums or that one in particular? Is it planted as well? It is. Mm -hmm. It's it's got several uh, four different species of plants in it so far. I may be adding some more, and it's got isopods, of course, and springtails in it. So what are some plants? Because I know snake people are always concerned. Snakes like to trample all of our plants and stuff like that. I mean, what are some good ones to start with? Well, this one, this is a, a setup from the bio dude who, you know, he, he keeps this in mind that garter snakes are pretty destructive and active and are going to trample plants a lot. So he gets plants that are resilient. One of them is uh, he's got dwarf snake plant in there and they're basically bulletproof. And, and funnily enough, are called snake plants. So that works. Um, <laughs> He's got Korean rock fern in there, which has a very springy stem, so a snake can smash it and it'll just bounce back up. And then uh, the other ferns, lemon button fern is in there as well, and I guess it's kind of the same thing. I keep that with my dart frogs as well. And then the other one was a uh, bird's nest fern. And I guess all of those are kind of resilient to snake damage, and that's why he specifically picked them out for that kit. Oh, that's awesome. And is there anything that we didn't hit? I mean, I'm sure there's there's stuff that you have that we haven't uh, talked about. Just that you would like to, uh, or maybe even things that they can check out on your YouTube channel. Sure. Yeah, if they want to learn more about isopods or other critters, because my channel is basically about anything you can keep in an aquarium or vivarium. Um, go to Aquarium X Pets. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter as well. Um, and I would love to see you come by and tell me, hey, um, Joe and Melissa sent me, and I'd be happy to welcome you, and, and you can check out what I've got. And I hope uh, my uh, viewers will come out and check yours out as well. 
Yes, please check out Russ's uh, Instagram because as someone who's become a beginner again, as far as keeping things, like when I first got into the IcePod, obviously know nothing, still know very little, but what I do know is mostly from you and your videos because, I mean, it's a great way to get information and you've put a lot of information out there. So thank you just for being like, I feel like you're the voice of uh, the IcePods. <laughs> Well, that's that's pretty cool. I'm glad I was able to introduce you to isopods and, and help you out, get a good start in the hobby, just like you're doing with me with reptiles. You know, um, I, I was checking out your videos a long time ago, and that that helped me get get a start too, with with snakes specifically. To Thank speak you. to that, I know you said like final questions. Is there like good like isopod books or things that people could read that you would suggest? Um, yeah, yeah. The I would say that Oren. I always say his name wrong. Orrin McMonagall wrote uh, an isopod, a couple of isopod books, and they are considered like the standard books in the hobby. There, he's actually there are a couple that are pretty old, and then there's one that's a newer one that he that came out pretty recently. So those are some good ones to start out with. But a lot, a lot of the information is pretty new, and so um, the the internet is a is a good source to go to. Of course, you have to filter what you find on the internet and kind of take it with a grain of salt. But in the same vein a lot of it is so new that um, there aren't a ton of books out there but that is one author that stands out to me but i was i was happy to see that through just searching there's a lot of i mean scientific publications on porcilium in, in particular armadillidium in particular so right and that that has been important for me to go through as i've been experimenting with uh, different husbandry techniques i'll go look at the scientific literature and say okay what's out there have they tested this does this make sense and, and so, yeah, it's, it's good to look that up. Not everybody bothers to do that, but it's there. It's, it's good information. And that's the boring part of the research. The YouTube videos <laughs> are the fun part. True. Someone in the chat just said you've written a book. Oh, well, yes. <laughs> uh, I guess I did. But my, the book I wrote about isopods uh, a number of years ago is, is mostly for children. Uh, okay. Children who want to keep isopods and just need that very basic information. I did write that, and it's on Amazon. And people have have liked it, but uh, I actually need to do a new edition because it doesn't include a lot of the stuff that we've discovered in the past few years. It's kind of an older book. But, well, at least it's at my reading level, so <laughs> yeah. I read way higher. <laughs> Let people know where we're at. I thought you were going to go into it. No. Flawlessly. Oh, sorry. No. In my head, I was like, oh, it's not my kid's reading level. And then I was like, oh, it's just playing what my kids are. And now I'm talking about it already. But. Oh, yeah. You should have isopods in your classroom. You get Russ's book. Yeah. Oh, there Boom. you go. Boom. Boom. Except we're talking about vertebrates right now. So we got to wait a little bit. Um, but if you, if anyone wants to reach out to us or wants to see what we're working with, Port City Pythons on Facebook, Port City Pythons on Instagram, Port City Pythons on YouTube. Obviously, if you're watching this um, video version of it, the audio version of the podcast is pretty much anywhere that podcast exists. Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, whatever other random ones I don't even know about. Um, write a very honest review. Writer, I would love if you'd write a review if you listen on the iTunes. Other than that... Um, we will catch you guys next week. Yes. Yes. And thank you, Russ, for hanging out with us. I mean, I feel like this is like Isopod 101. Hopefully people li listen to this and they know how to keep, you know, most of your common isopods. Yeah. I, I hope I hope it's given them a good introduction. I really enjoyed talking to you both. And thank you so much for inviting me. Of course. Anytime. And uh, hopefully we can have you on again once you produce uh, your blue death fiending beetles. Oh, that would be awesome. Sure, let's do it. Because apparently you're going to be one of the only guys to do it, and I have faith in you that you're going to do it. <laughs> well, thank I'm you. I, there right now. I need I need all the help I can get. So thank you. <laughs> awesome. Thank you again, and uh, we will catch you all next week. Yes, right. uh, Russ will still be on with you. Give us all right. One. Thank you. No, babe, wrong button. Oh, Jeez. wrong button. What are we wrong doing? Wrong button. <laughs> First time. <laughs>